Hello, and uh, welcome to this installment of, uh, of um, the presentations that I do here at the Holliston Council on Aging at the Senior Center. My name is Arthur Bergeron. For those of you who don't know me, I work at a firm called uh, Myrick O'Connell. There are, I think, now 67 of us. It, some people come and go. It keeps growing, basically. Um, and as a result of the fact there are so many lawyers, everybody kind of gets to do what they really like doing. Everybody's a specialist. And this is what I do. I do elder law. My median client age is 74. I like this because my clients still think I'm young. And I kind of try to focus on the issues that are of interest to folks um, who are older. Um, so what I try to do every year is, when I'm doing it this year, is in the first seminar every year, I try to do one general overview of elder law and how things might have changed. And that was the last seminar I did. And then I try to focus on more particular topics. This is a topic, <clears throat> excuse me, that is a little complicated, but of real interest to people, um, which is that Mass Health in uh, October proposed, um, actually in November of last year, proposed sweeping changes to their regulations um, regarding how you qualify for Mass Health, whether you're in a nursing home or at home. Now, when we, many of us went to a public hearing that they did in December to look, looking for comments supposedly on these regulations, and at that time, MassHealth said, we're going to impose these in whatever form they are in February. Well, it's now May. Nothing's been imposed. Nothing has changed yet. Um, and there was a lot of pushback on several of these regulations so that it may be that they won't happen. But several of them, I am sure, will happen. And, and I want to talk to you about all of those major changes. But in order to help you understand the change, before you can understand the significance of the changes, I need to do a little bit about telling you how the current regulations work so you can see how the change works. So for those of you who've been here before and just know this stuff, sorry, you get a review course a little bit, right? But then I'm going to talk to you how the changes affect you. So the people that I always talk about in these presentations are my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. You know, they, life is very simple. Their goal is they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. All things being equal, they want to make sure if one dies that the other one gets everything, and that following the death of the two of them, everything gets divided among their children. And the question is, you know, how does this go, how in, right now is this going to affect them? So to understand how the rules now work, you need to understand a little bit about their assets. There they are. Uh, they own a home that's worth $300,000. He has an IRA worth uh, 100000 They have an annuity worth a hundred. They have bank accounts worth a hundred. So they have a total assets of $600,000. He, he is on Social Security making $2,000 a month. She is getting half of his, or $1,000 a month. So they're, all, they're okay. You know, they don't have a mortgage. They got some cash. They're okay as long as nobody needs a nursing home care, in which case there's more of a potential problem, which is one of the things they worry about. I just read recently that folks worry more about, get, uh, people over 65 worry more about getting Alzheimer's than they do about getting cancer. I literally had a client last month who said, thank God I've got cancer. At least I don't have Alzheimer's. I was like, oh. So people worry about this. So um, usually when I'm talking about this in terms of figuring out how you qualify for mass health, I start off by assuming both Frank and Mary are alive. But for purposes of this presentation, I'm going to assume Frank died. Because it's easier to kind of understand, as I was thinking of the logic of these, to understand the, the, the changes that way. So assume that Frank's dead, Mary's now in the, is, is not feeling well, uh, and she may need nursing home care. And now if she does, um, that nursing home care, um, after the first few months, she's going to have to pay it privately unless she can qualify for mass health, because Medicare which she has, will only cover not more than 100 days in the nursing home. Um, and when she's on private pay, she's going to be paying in the neighborhood of about $12,000 a month, right? And remember, her, her, um, her income at this point, if Frank were dead, would be $2,000 a month. Because remember, Frank had income of Social Security of $2,000 a month. If he dies, she gets his. She doesn't get hers anymore, but she gets his. So her income would now be $2,000 a month. Um, now, this would be true, because, as I mentioned, because if she were in the nursing home, she would only be getting covered by Medicare if she had first spent three days in the hospital, admitted, not just under observation status, which is very common now, three days in the hospital, and then she gets to the nursing home, they'll pay the nursing home care, Medicare will, but no more than 100 days worth of care. And even then, they'll only pay if she needs skilled care. 
That is, if, they're, if the nursing home is certifying that she needs to be seeing a, 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 um, a nurse, a skilled uh, um, uh, registered nurse, uh, or a physical therapist, like a lot. Otherwise, they'll knock her off. That's the reason why the average amount of, or the median amount, number of days that Medicare pays in a nursing home is 17, not 100. Um, finally, I just want to mention, for those of you who are kind of interested in this issue, um, this 100 days that you get, you get every time you go to the hospital with a so-called period of illness. Uh, a period of illness is defined as one for which you've stayed for three days. And so if you go to the hospital, go to the nursing home, go home, stay home for at least 60 days, and then go back to the hospital for three more days, you get another 100 days in the nursing home. So I'm just going to mention one other thing, by the way, before we go on, which is something kind of new that I learned. Uh, we have always talked to our clients when they come in and they're in this situation about saying, well, you know, you know your spouse is in the nursing home and she's, and she's on Medicare right now. You've got some time to restructure things so that by the time her Medicare days end, she'll be able to qualify right away for Mass Health, figuring that while she was on Medicare, everything was covered. And then about six months ago, we had a client um, who was in a nursing home, not in this area, up in the north of Worcester, who we did this for. So the woman had, the mother had gone to the hospital and then the nursing home and was in the nursing home for like two and a half months. Uh, she was on the, or she was on there for longer than that, but she was on Medicare for like two and a half months. Um, and then she immediately qualified for Mass Health. Um, and so we figured we were all set. And then the daughter got a bill from the nursing home for like $6,000. And I said, she said, what's this? I said, I don't, I, I don't know. I said, I, I don't understand. This must be a mistake. So we went back and talked to the nursing home. And the, and the woman at the administrator said, oh, that's the copay for when she was on Medicare. I said, the copay? She said, yes, yeah. she was on a Medicare Advantage plan, a so-called Medicare um, um, C plan. And under the terms of that plan, the copay in the nursing home was $160 a day. Now there's a copay, right? So you just want to be aware of that, that if, if you're in the nursing home, you want to get things restructured so that you can qualify for Mass Health as quickly as possible, it, just to make sure that you avoid this copay. So anyway, if Mary is in the nursing home and she's not on Medicare and she's on private pay and she's got income of $2,000 a month, um, you want to be kind of, she wants to be considering always when she's thinking about qualifying the burn rate. And I always refer to the burn rate as the difference between the cost of the nursing home or the cost of whatever service you're getting uh, and your income. Because, or specifically, if you're in the nursing home, once you've qualified for Mass Health, you continue to have to pay your income to the nursing home. And then MassHealth pays the difference between that amount and whatever the nursing home bill is, right? So, so the, the burn rate, the rate at which you have to use your savings up, is really the nursing home cost minus your income, minus your income from Social Security. So the burn rate in Mary's case, if the nursing home were $12,000 a month, would be $10,000 because it's $12,000 minus her income that, so she'd be using her savings up at the rate of about $10,000 per month. Um, now, once she's on MassHealth, as I mentioned, MassHealth will be paying the difference between her income uh, and the nursing home rate, except they'll allow her to keep a fabulous $72.80 per month. So once she's on MassHealth, she doesn't have a whole lot of resources. So when we're trying to plan for Mary, we're also trying to plan to see if there's a way that we can make sure that while she's on Mass Health, she's still got some resources because she isn't get, she's not going to have a lot in this situation. So if Mary's trying to qualify for Mass Health. As I mentioned, the asset limit right now is $2,000. Now remember, in the, in the example that we gave, her assets are actually $600,000. She owns her home, and she has other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to about another $300,000. Now. You can qualify for Mass Health and still own your home. Um, Mass Health, once you've qual as long as you say in your application that you intend to return home. Now, Mass Health will at that point put a lien on your home in order to make sure that um, that when when after you've after you've died, they can recoup whatever they've paid on your behalf. But the point is, all you need to do is spend down your other money. In this case, the other three hundred thousand dollars, and you can qualify for Mass Health. <clears throat> so one other thing. Suppose Mary's not feeling well, but she wants to stay home, which of course we all do. Nobody really wants to go to the nursing home. Well, in that case, as long as 
as, ma as Mass Health determines that she is otherwise eligible for a nursing home, they will also pay to help her stay at home. The program is called the Frail Elder Waiver. Um, the significance of that program, and of course, because that's everybody's goal really, is to stay at home. Um, and now the frail elder, through the Frail Elder Waiver, they'll pay for a given number of hours, typically not more than about 50 hours a week, although that's quite a bit, right, to help Mary stay at home and otherwise not have to go to a nursing home. The, the criteria for that program, similar to the nursing home program, same thing, $2,000 is the, is the amount of her assets, but she can have her home. But also there's an income uh, uh, number of $2,205 per month if she has more than that amount of income, then she has to pay a copay. We're not going to go into the details on that, but I just I wanted you to be aware of that. In my example, though, she would qualify for this program because, as we mentioned, her income here is $2,000 a month. And the reason why that's of significance to Mary, um, once again, is many don't, people don't appreciate the fact that staying home can cost you actually more than being in the nursing home. That's one of the reasons why some folks end up in the nursing home. Uh, there are, if, if Mary needed 24-hour care, this would be really problematic for her because there are 8,760 hours in a year. That's a piece of trivia for you. Um, the, the, the typical home care rate for an agency around here is about $25 an hour. So at that rate, for that many hours, it would cost you about $219,000 to stay at home with 24-7 home care. So if Mary needed that amount of care, this probably wouldn't work for her. But if, on the other hand, She's, maybe her spouse is at home, one of the kids is at home, one of the, one of the children, Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr. So they, just, so they just need coverage maybe during the work day so that your child can go to work or for some period of time. It may be that 40, 50 hours a week will allow you to stay home. And in this program, if Mass Health is paying for 50 hours of home care a week at $25 an hour, over a year that value is that's worth $65,000. So it may give Mary the ability, with this combined with the 300000 in savings that she still has, to stay at home. So in either case, she wants to try to qualify for mass health. So the question is, how does she do that? Well, first of all, I'm just going to mention, once again, the burn, these, these, these burn rates. If, for example, um, uh, the private pay rate were $10,000 a month, and, and, or excuse me, were... were um, uh, between ten and fifteen thousand dollars a month. Excuse me. I take this back. I'm on, mentally I'm on the wrong slide. Remember, as I mentioned earlier, if Mary qualifies for Mass Health and Mass Health starts paying for her, for her care, after she dies, Mass Health is going to have a lien to get her, their money back, which would lead you to ask yourself, so why should she qualify for Mass Health then? If it's all if it's all going to be the same thing. Right? Because either she pays privately or she gets on Mass Health, Mass Health covers the bill, and then Mass Health has to get, is kind of come back and collect. Well, the reason is this. <clears throat> if Mary is on private pay in a nursing home right now, her typical monthly cost will be somewhere between ten dollars and $15,000. Once she is on Mass Health, remember she's paying her income and Mass Health is paying the difference between her income and the nursing home rate at the, at the Mass Health rate which is a special rate. It's not like the private pay rate, and it's typically around, it goes between six and $8,000. It's typically about $7,000. So once again, if, in our example, if Mary spends a year in a nursing home, she's paying $12,000 a month, minus her social security is two, is her burn rate is 10,000 a month. For a year, it's gonna cost her about $120,000, right? She's in the same bed in the same nursing home, and she's on Mass Health. The mass health rate is $7,000 a month, minus her two, means that the amount they're going to want back after she dies is $5,000 a month, or over the same year, $60,000. So she just cut her nursing home cost in half by, just by being on mass health, for the same bed, getting the same care in the same nursing home. Okay? Um, so once again, there are Mary's assets. Six, th same as Frank's, same as they were when she was with Frank, right? Three hundred thousand dollars, and then she's got about a, in a house, and then she's got three, about three hundred thousand dollars more. And the question is, so how does she get to be below two thousand dollars in countable assets? Because that's what she's got to be at before she can qualify. Well, today there are two ways for her to do that. One is that she can buy an annuity. She can buy an, an is, is, and as long as that annuity has certain characteristics 
the purchase of the annuity as a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So because and as, as long as Mary, after she's bought the annuity, can't cash it in, and as long as it calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than her actuarial life expectancy. And if Mary is, in this example, 80 years old, Mary's life expectancy is about 12 years. So one of the things she can do right now is she can go buy an annuity. So suppose she did that. Suppose she knew that she was going to get on mass health by doing this. And so she, and she, you know, she knows her income is $2,000 a month. So suppose she takes her $300,000 and says, okay, I'm going to buy an annuity that's going to pay me $5,000 a month. So my income is going to go up from $2,000 a month for the Social Security to $7,000 a month because it's going to be Social Security plus the annuity. So I'm going to be earning $7,000 a month and I'm going to pay that right to the nursing home because remember once you're on MassHealth, MassHealth says you pay all your income to the nursing home and then we'll pay the difference between that and the, nurse, and the, and the, and the mass health cost of that nursing home bed. But remember, in our example, the mass health cost of that nursing home bed is only $7,000. So if Mary pays the nursing home $7,000 a month, there is no mass health lien because mass health isn't paying anything to the nursing home. By qualifying for mass health, Mary has simply reduced her cost from $12,000 a month to $7,000 a month and has, and, 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 has, and has basically eliminated her, her daily burn rate and knows that even after she dies, this money was only burn, being burned away at the rate of, 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 of $5,000 a month. And if she buys an annuity, and by the way, if she buys an annuity with $300,000 that's going to pay about $5,000 a month, assuming she earns no interest, which is pretty close to the case. Um, these annuities pay terrible interest. They pay like 1% interest. No one would buy one of these unless you're doing it to qualify for mass health. And as a matter of fact, if you call the annuity company and they, they get a, you get a quote for this, they call them Medicaid qualifying annuities. That's the only reason why you buy it, is to qualify for mass health. So at the end of five years, these payments would have all gone to Mary and Mary would have paid them to the nursing home. She dies and she's still got her house Right? Because she, remember, she could keep her house. Um, but there's no lien on the house because MassHealth never paid any money to the nursing home. If she dies after a year, um, she's, paid these, you know, she's paid these annuity payments for this, for this year. Um, and as a result, the nursing home's been getting all their money, all $7,000 a month. And at the end of the year, there's four more years worth of annuity payments to be paid that can go to her kids because MassHealth has no lien. So, this is one of the two ways that folks will qualify for mass health now if they're single, right? Which leads to potential rule change number one from mass health's perspective. And that is, they're saying that if you are over 80, if you are, excuse me, they're saying that the only annuities that you can buy are commercial annuities. The reason why I say that is, it, and you say, well, where else would you buy an annuity? Well, the rules don't say in them now that when you buy that annuity, when Mary buys that annuity, she has to buy it from an insurance company. She could also buy it from one of her kids. She could pay one of her kids $300,000 in return for an annuity that said that they were going to be paying her back at the rate of $5,000 a month for the five years. Right? And as long as the rates are commercially valid, as long as they're the same rates that the, that the, that the insurance company would have paid, you can do that. The reason why that is of significance is if Mary were over 89 years old, her life expectancy would be less than four years. Remember the rule that I had mentioned to you said, in order to buy a, an annuity that as far as mass health is concerned is okay, the term of the annuity has to be shorter than your actuarial life expectancy. So her annuity has to be for less than four years. She can't buy a commercial annuity right now for less than four years. They don't sell them. The reason is because the interest rates are so low that the insurance companies don't make any money if they sell shorter annuities. Which means from Mary's perspective, if this rule change occurs and she's over 89 years old, she can no longer use this annuity route in order to qualify herself for mass health because she won't be able to buy it privately from one of her kids and she won't be able to get it commercially because they don't sell them, 
Okay? So for older folks, this could be a big deal. So the, when I, once again, these rules haven't been adopted yet, so I'm giving you my, my best sense. I would say the chance that this one's going to get adopted is around 50-50. It's not, this one's not clear at all. It's not a huge money loser to the Commonwealth right now. It's just, this one's just not clear. All right? But if it happens, it's going to mean that as far as Mary is concerned, when she gets older, she can't use that device to qualify, which is going to leave her with this buying a, or, or excuse me, um, putting her money into a so-called D4C pooled trust. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a D4C pooled trust. Ah, this is a piece of trivia for you. Um, so a D4C pooled trust, these are trusts that are specifically allowed under the Medicaid law. Under the Medicaid law, in general, if you give your money to a trustee, like one of your kids or somebody else, and the rules are that, 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 the, that your trustee can give it back to you or use it on your behalf, Mass Health says in that case, they have to use it to pay the nursing home. They have to use it to spend the money down. There are some exceptions. One of them is in a, federal, in a, a part of the federal law called 42 U.S.C. 1396 P1C D4C. Uh, without going through the reason for that, why that's it. That's where you would find it in the federal law, which says if you give it, if you put the money in this kind of trust and give it to this kind of trustee, then even though the money can still be used for your benefit, it doesn't count as far as qualifying for mass health and doesn't have to be used to pay down the nursing home. So how does the D4C work? What is a D4C? Well, a, a, they're called D4C pooled trusts. And the way they work is that they, the, you give the money to the entity that's doing the pooled trust and they pool it with all the other money that they have and they invest and reinvest the money. That's why they're called pooled trusts. But they keep track of yours and that money can be used while you're alive to, do, to provide any benefit that you want, to do anything that could improve your life. If you want to learn more about these, you can just Google pooled trusts if you're on your computer. Uh, or you can, you can check out any one of these list of uh, D4Cs that are all in your handouts. These are the five um, entities that have D4C pooled trusts in Massachusetts. We typically use Plan of Massachusetts and Rhode Island because they're the closest. Um, and so you give the money to the pool trust, and then they invest it and reinvest it, and they assign a social worker to you, or if you're doing it on behalf of your mother or your spouse, to the, your, to, the, to the senior. And then that person will work with you to figure out how to best use this money to benefit that person. So what can it be used for? Well, it can be used for anything. And I'm going to start with the bottom. Because remember, Mary can qualify for Mass Health if she's in the nursing home, is in, and keep her house. <clears throat> Except once she has qualified, all of her income has to go to the nursing home, right? And then, the, and then Mass Health pays the rest. Which leads to the question, so how does she pay her taxes on her house, right? Which she still has, or the insurance, or the oil bill, or anything, right? Well, the answer in this case is that the, the money could be paid from the D4C. If so if she took her money, put it into the D4C, they could keep, maintain her house while she was alive. Right? Um, because I mean, she may have tenants there, they can, do, they can, they can take care of the house. Uh, or they could use the money to improve Mary's life while she's at the nursing home. Now, of course, nobody's life is great in the nursing home, right? I mean, that, nobody aspires to go to the nursing home. But that said, if you're stuck there, you know, there are better and worse days or ways to spend a day in the nursing home. And I'll get, for example, you can buy a better bed as opposed to the standard institutional bed that's there. You can buy a better chair as opposed to the Naga Hyde chair. You can buy, if you're, if you're not crazy about the fact that your neighbor, because the, these nursing homes, almost all nursing home rooms are doubles. If you're not crazy about the fact that your neighbor has got the TV on all the time, uh, or in the case that I just faced, I was just went into a nursing home to see a client who was in one bed. Uh, and her neighbor was with her family, and they're talking, and the TV is on, and everything's in Spanish, because the lady's Spanish, the lady's Hispanic, and, which is great, except imagine having dementia, and all you're hearing is Spanish, you know, like all the time, you know, it's like, where am I, right? But you could deal with that. You could buy, you could buy Mary a flat screen TV, you know, you could buy headphones, you could buy movies, you know, you could do a lot of things to give her, pri her privacy in her own room. Or you can buy her a better wheelchair. That's the example that I always think about when I go, how many people here have been to a nursing home? How many people? Uh, majority. So, 
you go to the nursing home, one of the things that I find is the most distressing about being in a nursing home is seeing that person in the hall in the wheelchair trying to sleep. And they're kind of crunched over like this, trying to sleep. Now the reason why that occurs is because they're in the wrong wheelchair. They're in a wheelchair that's owned by the nursing home and that is used to transport people from room to room. They're not designed to sleep in and they cost $1,000. But $10,000, you can buy one that reclines, it's got a cup holder, it's got a little TV set, use headphones, you can get a motorized if you think Mary could handle that, right? So the point is you, you can make Mary's life a lot better with Mary, using Mary's money. Final example I'm just gonna use is my, my lobster friend. So I, was, I did, several years ago, I was doing this presentation or a presentation about qualifying for Mass Health and talking about D4Cs. And this lady came up to me afterwards and said, oh, Mr. Bergeron, she said, I sh I'm sorry I didn't know about this before. We, you know, I didn't know my mother could keep her house. We sold the house and we had all the money and then we used the money to spend down on the nursing home. So it's, we had a quarter of a million dollars. Now we only have 60,000 left. Would it still be worth doing a D4C? And I said to the lady, I said, sure. I said, I said you know, in the real world, $60,000 is still a lot of money. When you're buy paying the nursing home, it's only like five months in the nursing home, but it's a lot. So she did, she, we put the money in the D4C, she qualified her mother. And then the caseworker came out to talk with the daughter <clears throat> and talk about her mother. She said, so, so, so we have this money to improve your mother's life. What is your mother like? Oh, you know, could we, could we do a flat screen TV? Could we do something that would really, so she can watch whatever movies she just loves seeing? Oh, well, my mother's pretty blind, you know. She's like 93 years old, she's blind. Oh, well, how about music? Is there any, you know, we could do the same thing. We could buy a CD player. We could, you know, get her headphones. We could listen to Frank Sinatra for the rest of her life. You know? No, my mother's really pretty deaf, too. She said, well, does she have any favorite foods? And the lady said, oh, yeah. She said, you know, when we were growing up, we, you know, we was two or three, there were several kids. And we didn't have a lot of money, but once a year, we would go to Maine, we'd go to the shore, and we'd go out and get lobster in the rough. My mother loved lobster in the rough, right? So this lady literally told me, she said, you know, your mother can have lobster every day. So, so and by the way, you know, so, and, and you know, this sounds like, why not? This isn't like a welfare queen getting lobster. This is a lady that saved all of her life, They've had, they have some savings, and rather than having to spend every dime on a nursing home and then having to live on $72 a month, right, she gets to have some lobster. So you can use the money for a whole variety of things, which would lead you to the question, well, in that case, why wouldn't you always do that as opposed to buying an annuity? <clears throat> and the answer is, they charge a commission. Uh, the D4C, they charge an entrance fee of like $1,000. Um, and yearly when they're managing your money, they charge you a point, just like you'd be paying a money manager. But then when you die, depending on how long they've had the money, they will keep a percentage of the remaining money, somewhere between five and 20%. So to the extent that, um, especially if you think that the person's gonna live for a long time and might exhaust all of their money, you would put all the money in the D4C. If on the other hand, you have quite a bit of money, you may wanna just put part of it in there and then use part of it to buy an annuity. Except, <clears throat> this is the other, uh, rule change number two. Under the current rules, Mary can do this the day before she qualifies for Mass Health. She can transfer the money to the D4C. There is a proposed rules change that would say that the tr transfers to the D4C are subject to the five-year look-back rule, which would mean they would become useless for this purpose, right? Because you don't have five years if you're Mary, right? You, you know, you need to qualify now. Um, and so that would take, and so Mary, especially if she were older, would therefore have no way of qualifying for Mass Health if she, if she can't buy an, an annuity because they get rid of uh, private annuities, and if she can't put the money into the D4C. Well, there's been a lot of pushback on this one. And that's why, among other things, in the Senate, there was a bill proposed, Senate 629, which has got something like 45 co sponsors, the Senate com combined Senate and House. Um, and there's a lot. There's a, there is a sense in the legislature that they, will, that they will basically pass something to keep this from happening. And because of all of that, that MassHealth may never even do the change in the rule. So my, in my opinion, the chance of this rule changing is probably less than 20%. So I think there is going to remain this vehicle through which Mary could qualify for MassHealth. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about the current rules if Frank and Mary are both alive because those two are changing in a couple of ways. So if Frank and Mary are both alive, 
as I've explained in, in previous presentations here, if Mary needs to qualify for Mass Health today because she's you know, just had a stroke, she's in the nursing home, she can do it like right away. And the reason is that, because, that although Mary cannot have more than $2,000 in countable assets, Frank can own the house as long as it has an equity of now, <clears throat> excuse me, $840,000 as long as he has cash or cash equivalent assets of less than $120,000, $220. But he can also have unlimited income. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the summer, which is definitely already started, and I'll see you all in the fall. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.